Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Rudy Farias? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. Rudolph Farias IV was born on October 1, 1997, and lived in Houston, Texas. He went by the name Rudy. His father, Rudolph Farias III, was a police officer. He brought an end to his own life in 2014, as he was the target of an internal affairs investigation. Rudy's mother was named Janie Santana. In 2011, Rudy's half-brother died in a motorcycle collision. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On March 7, 2015, Rudy's mother, Janie, reported him missing. She claimed that he had been walking his two dogs one day earlier on March 6. He was supposedly last seen around 6.30 p.m. near Tidwell and Park Drive. The dogs returned home, but Rudy did not. I guess they could have asked the dogs what happened to Rudy, but that would have been barking up the wrong tree. Cheney indicated that Rudy had a few mental and physical health conditions. For example, an injured leg that caused him to walk with a slight limp, a fear of strangers, PTSD, depression, and anxiety, and asthma, which may have been untreated because he did not have his inhaler with him. Janie said that she had been desperately searching for Rudy. She claimed that the Houston Police Department told her that Rudy may have been the victim of human trafficking. She said that Rudy would never just get up and leave on his own, and implied the experience was a nightmare that she could not wake up from. In 2018, the police received a call from a relative who claimed they had seen Rudy behind their home. Officers investigated, but did not find Rudy. On June 29, 2023, the Houston police responded to a 911 call reporting an unresponsive man outside the Immaculate Heart Church. When the police arrived, they found 25-year-old Rudy Farias. He was alive. Rudy's mother, Janie, made several claims after Rudy was found. Here are a few of them. Rudy sustained cuts and bruises all over his body and had dried blood on his head. He was receiving the care he needed to overcome trauma and was nonverbal. He remained disoriented and would only say a few words before shutting down and going into a fetal position. And Rudy kept squeezing a necklace that belonged to his late half-brother every time physicians or family members attempted to speak to him. For many outside observers, the discovery of Rudy Farias was a joyous time, which resolved an eight-year mystery. But the reality of the situation was much different. At a press conference, the police announced that Rudy Farias had not been missing for eight years. He had actually returned home on March 8, 2015, one day after being reported missing. The police had interviewed Janie and Rudy during the eight years that Rudy was considered missing, but the police did not realize that they were talking to Rudy. Both Janie and Rudy claimed that Rudy was Janie's nephew and supplied a false name. Janie's neighbors told the media that they were never aware that Rudy was considered missing because they had seen him many times in recent years. One neighbor who lived a few houses from Janie said that Rudy would come into her garage and spend time with her family members. The neighbor added that Rudy would sometimes go to the park by himself. A cousin of this neighbor said that he would hang out and laugh with Rudy. Janie stood by her story and claimed that the neighbors had actually seen her nephew and had not seen Rudy. The district attorney declined to file charges against Janie or Rudy for making false statements to the police. The police would not offer any theories about a possible motive for this hoax. Rudy gave an interview to a local TV station after his miraculous return from the land of the never missing. Here's what he said. He felt as though he was stuck at his home during the eight-year period when he was supposedly missing. He didn't leave the home often except to go to work with his mother. If somebody would come over, his mother would tell him to stay in his room and keep the door locked. He 
he wasn't to let anyone in or make any sounds. His mother frightened him by saying that he would be arrested if he left the home. She bombarded him with negative thoughts and brainwashed him. He had the free will to leave, but his mother kept confusing him into maintaining the hoax. She locked him in mentally. Rudy felt as though the only person he could trust was his mother. He was highly dependent on her. Rudy tried to explain the level of control that Janie had over him by saying, quote, Every time I'd come around her, it's like a little trigger pops up. I'd been trying to get away from my mom, and I'd hear a little notice, and it would be like a little reminder in my head, don't do that, don't say this, unquote. Rudy does not want a relationship or any contact with his mother in the future. He felt a lot of relief since the story was made public and felt as though he was at peace. He wanted to have a family, a job, a car, and a house, and live his life. Reportedly, Rudy was living away from his mother with family members from his mother's side. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Four private investigators had tried to find Rudy Farias when he was supposedly missing. One private investigator named Brenda said that she believed Janie could be suffering from a condition like Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Brenda had her suspicions about Janie from the beginning and was not surprised at all by the outcome of this case. She believed that Janie was hoping to earn money in the form of donations. Janie refused to supply any recent photographs of her son Rudy at the time he supposedly went missing. The image used on the flyers was Rudy at the age of 14. Janie said that she thought if Rudy looked younger, it would generate more empathy. Searchers found an asthma inhaler and a backpack at the scene of the alleged disappearance. Family members said that they belonged to Rudy, but the police learned that this claim was untrue. Rudy never had asthma. Another private investigator named Ryan said that Janie claimed that a woman was holding Rudy in Mexico. Ryan tracked down the alleged offender and called her. The woman said that Janie had talked to her. She told Janie that she did not want to be involved in her scam. At another point, Janie told Ryan about communications from her son's alleged kidnappers in Tijuana, Mexico. When Ryan heard the dialect of the alleged kidnappers, he realized that it did not match that region of Mexico. Item number two, a local activist told the media that Rudy had endured years of mistreatment at the hands of his mother, Janie. During an interview with the media, Rudy said that his mother crossed boundaries, like making him sleep in the same bed as her, but he did not believe she committed any crime related to sex. Item number three, Janie's ex-husband accused her of bigamy. The couple had been married in 2012, but in 2013 he filed a petition for annulment. He said that he learned that Janie was legally married to at least one man and had four other possible husbands. The annulment was granted. Item number four, Janie allegedly had multiple social media profiles that contained fake pictures and she would comment on her own posts. This makes it seem like she was attention-seeking. Perhaps this characteristic motivated her to perpetrate the missing person hoax as well. Item number five. As I mentioned, it has been suggested that Janie could have Munchausen syndrome by proxy. The official name for this disorder is factitious disorder imposed on another. This is a disorder where a caregiver intentionally induces, falsifies, or exaggerates manifestations of physical or mental health symptoms in a person who is under their care. Often the perpetrator is a parent and the victim is a child. There is no way to know if Janie had this disorder or not, but there are a few similarities between the typical behavior of a perpetrator with factitious disorder imposed on another and Janie's behavior. For example, the perpetrator falsely asserts that the victim is ill, impaired, or injured. Janie said that Rudy had asthma when he did not. She also may have suggested he had cancer when he did not. The perpetrator is not motivated by any obvious external incentives, like financial gain. Janie allegedly collected over $2,000 from a GoFundMe campaign right after pretending that Rudy was missing. But considering that the hoax lasted for eight years, she really didn't make that much money for her effort. 
The perpetrators tend to be pathological liars. Janie has certainly demonstrated trouble telling the truth. Despite the similarities between factitious disorder imposed on another criteria and Janie's behavior, there are a few reasons to believe that this disorder was not involved in this case. For example, perpetrators tend to get excited when their victim's life hangs in the balance, but Rudy was not in danger of dying. The perpetrators tend to be between 20 and 30 years old. Janie was older than this. And the majority of victims are under 6 years old. Rudy was 17 when the hoax was initiated. One possibility in this case is that Janie had the same core motives as somebody with factitious disorder imposed on another, but they were expressed in a different way. She found an alternate method of attracting attention that did not involve the medical system or medical treatment. Janie pretended that Rudy was missing to reap many of the same benefits as a person with factitious disorder imposed on another without all the same risks. Janie's method was a lot easier. People felt sorry for Janie, they treated her like a victim, they had empathy for her, and she maintained control over her son. Janie was able to obtain all these benefits without repeated visits to physicians, learning medical terminology, and constantly having to be worried that a medical test would expose her deception. Janie found another way to beat the system, another way to meet her needs. Maybe Janie simply did not want Rudy to grow up and leave, so she devised this missing person hoax to trap him in fear. Item number six, Rudy mentioned the possibility of Stockholm Syndrome during his interview with the media. This is where a hostage starts to develop a positive bond with a kidnapper and prefers to remain with them. A famous example of this is the Patty Hearst case. Stockholm Syndrome is also referred to by other names like learned helplessness, identification with the aggressor, and trauma bonding. It is not actually a mental disorder. Rather, it is considered an unusual but natural reaction to the stress of being kidnapped. The hostage forms a strong emotional bond with the kidnapper because they share life-threatening experiences. I'm not convinced that Stockholm Syndrome was involved in this case. The condition is uncommon, and Rudy wasn't really kidnapped or in a life-threatening situation. It's more likely that Rudy simply did not understand how the world worked, and he believed his mother when she said he would be arrested. I think he was simply the victim of manipulation. Now moving to the last item, number seven. Did prosecutors make the right decision by refusing to charge Janie and Rudy? I believe it was appropriate not to charge Rudy, but Janie should have been charged. Even if society wants to forgive her for the hoax, she should have to answer for the manipulation. If she really caused Rudy to live in fear for eight years, then charges are appropriate. Now moving to my final thoughts. Janie perpetrated a missing person hoax without actually having a missing person. The police literally stood right in front of Rudy, but believed Janie's lies when she misidentified him as her nephew. Investigators could have checked out her story, but they probably didn't think anyone would be brazen enough to perpetrate such a simple and lazy hoax. I can imagine Janie introducing the idea of the hoax to Rudy. He comes home after a long walk with his dogs, and Janie says something like, it was really nice around here when you were gone. Let's pretend you're missing all the time. The only way this scam could have been lazier is if Janie told the police that she was the one who was missing. There are seemingly no limits to the deviousness and creativity that people use to meet their needs. Janie wanted people to think of her as a victim, a loving mother who was trapped in a nightmare. She claimed that she wanted her son to be found, but in the end, it was Janie who would be found wanting. Those are my thoughts in the case of Rudy Farias. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.